Hello and welcome to another edition of Islamic Finance Weekly, where we discuss the key development in the industry and opportunities for Nigeria to tap into. For this edition, I have with me Mr. Bandi Fenitola, Senior Director, Head of Treasury and Financial Institutions of African Finance Corporation, AFC. It is a pleasure talking to you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Speaking on the development around Islamic finance, how can Islamic finance be a key objective to African finance cooperation that cover infrastructure development, capital market development, and sustainable financing? I think um, clearly, you know, Africa Finance Cooperation is very, very much into financing infrastructure, not just in Nigeria, but across the entire continent of Africa. We've been in existence since 2007. And during that time, we've invested about $6.6 .6 billion in close to 30 African countries. We do that primarily in several sectors like the energy sector, which is a power sector, which is quite important. Uh, we invest in, in natural resources, which is oil, gas, and mining. We invest in heavy industries. We invest in telecoms. We invest in transport infrastructure across the continent. And just to put a context to that, if you look at the continent of Africa today, the infrastructure gap is so huge. There's a huge need to finance infrastructure across the continent. You have 1.2 billion people on the continent. Over half of those do not have access to electricity as we speak today. And if you look at the gap in terms of infrastructure gap on the continent today, it reduces GDP and productivity by as much as 2%. So if we can solve that infrastructure problem on the continent, then clearly you know, it improves the lives of Africans. So when you look at that in that context, it tells you that you need a lot of capital to come help in financing infrastructure in the continent. That would come from conventional sources. It can also come from Islamic finance sources because the continent needs all the capital that it can get. And you know, when I look at the Islamic finance universe, you're talking of an industry that's over $2 trillion. You know, if we can just get a sizable allocation of that to come into the continent of Africa to help us, you know, invest on the continent to improve our infrastructure across the continent, then you can imagine the impact of that in terms of development. So I think it's quite important. So Islamic finance is certainly important. It's something that the AFC itself is very much at the forefront of pushing and, and tapping that source of liquidity. So what is the collaboration like between the AFC and Islamic Financial Development Institution, like Islamic Development Bank? A couple of years ago, we, um, we got a line of finance from, from the Islamic Development Bank. Um, I've personally visited them several times. Um, we collaborate across projects, you know, apart from them lending to us. We also try to look at projects together across the member countries of the Islamic Development Bank in Africa in order to co-finance um, projects. So it's Islamic Development Bank is an entity that we know quite well. Uh, as I speak today, they are one of our financiers in terms of um, a Sukuk type of loan. So I think that's quite important. And in terms of other sources of Islamic finance, about three years ago, we issued our first Sukuk bond you know, it was a 100% Morabaha structure. And, you know, along the lines of that financing, we we're able to tap investors in Malaysia, investors in other parts of Asia, in the Middle East. And for us, you know, that was an opportunity for us to diversify our funding and to tap this big pool of Islamic funding that is available, which all you need is a, an appropriate structure to make it work. So for the size of the financing we need, on the continent, it's very important that we have all this relationship with all the Islamic lenders and the Islamic lend investor base on, across the world. Nigeria has a huge infrastructure deficit and also needs to attain sustainable development. Both require effective financing vehicles. How can Islamic financial institution be positioned in the country in addressing aforementioned issues? You know, beyond Islamic financial institutions and the Islamic investor base. You know, we need all hands on deck to help Nigeria to bridge its own infrastructure gap. I mean, the infrastructure gap in Nigeria is, 
is clear for everyone to see, be it the power sector, the state of our roads, you know, the airports in Lagos, and several other things that we see. I mean, you just need to drive around Lagos in the morning during traffic time or in the evening in the peak of traffic and you imagine the number of hours that people spend in traffic. And if you quantify that in terms of productivity and GDP, then you begin to appreciate how much of lost productivity we have by having people on the road, how much of lost time people could have spent with their families and their children, you know, having a proper work-life balance. We miss all that simply because we have this huge infrastructure gap in Nigeria. So I think the Islamic finance world is important. You know, a lot of times when we talk uh, at conferences, at places, people describe Islamic finance as an alternative. I don't like to use the word alternative. It's also so important. It's, it's, to me, it's mainstream, you know. So I don't like that dichotomy between conventional and Islamic. All sources of financing are important. And for a country like Nigeria, that's already tapping the so-called conventional sources of financing, it's very important that the Islamic sources of financing are also tapped. I know, I mean, a couple of sukuks have been done, but we're still at a very early stage in Nigeria. And considering the pool of liquidity that is out there in the Islamic finance world that is looking for the right type of asset, Nigeria is a very, very ripe and good place where investments, if properly structured, can satisfy what most Sharia boards need and what most Islamic finance um, investors are looking for. So I think Nigeria needs to position itself. We need to be ahead of the game and we need to make ourselves an attractive destination for investment, not just for Islamic finance, but even for the so-called conventional finance. From the record, you have invested about $6.6 .6 billion in 30 African countries to address critical issues and projects. How would you describe the impact of those projects to socio-economic activities of clients like Nigeria? So we are a multilateral financial institution and when we look at projects, when we look at investments, every investment we make must satisfy two things. First is it must have a developmental impact. So we will never do the most profitable project that has zero developmental impact. That's not why we're set up. At the same time, we don't do projects that are purely developmental, not because they're not good, they're great, but if they don't offer a commercial return, we don't do them as well. In fact, when we look at sustainability, you know, the way we look at sustainability is projects are actually sustainable when they are commercially viable. Because if you have to start depending on government subsidy, government interventions before a project becomes bankable, then we have a problem. That means that over the long term, that project cannot stand on its own without a lot of support. So for us, it's quite important when we look at projects that all these things are done. So when we've invested across the continent, across you know, close to 30 countries, like you said, developmental impact is so important. And I'll cite some examples. So Gabon, and we have a project in Gabon where we invested a couple of years ago. On the back of that, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a special economic zone, which we did in partnership with um, other players, other global players. And the whole intention is to migrate the country away from being highly dependent on hydrocarbon to becoming a more diversified economy. And as I say this, you can picture Nigeria in the same light, right? Because Gabon is oil producing, Nigeria is oil producing. And the whole idea was, you know, invest in creating a special economic zone that had a mineral port, a general cargo port. On the back of that, we've invested in a manganese mine we're looking at doing a power project and connecting the rail to the ports and, you know, in order to create like an ecosystem of projects. Today, that project you know, employs, give or take, close to 5,000 people who work in the special economic zone. We've been able to transform that country from a country that exports just logs of wood historically to do a lot of beneficiation in the country. In the process, the value addition has increased what they've, you know, what they get in terms of foreign exchange by several multiples. So that's an example of where we've been able to transform an economy from being just a single product into a multi-product example. I'll give one more example. In Cape Verde, we built their first wind farm, and that wind farm provides a significant chunk of the country's electricity. 
In the past, they only provided power by importing diesel and heavy fuel. Now it's a wind farm, it's, na it's nature. So we've saved them a lot of foreign exchange by simply transforming them from a heavy fuel powered you know, economy to wind, which is a renewable source of energy. In um, Sam Power in Ghana, is another example of a project that we've done, developed that from scratch, and today provides a sizable amount of the Ghanaian uh, power that they need. So there's a lot in terms of what we're doing, you know, and everything we do, the developmental impact is huge. I mean, one more example, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, we built a bridge across the lagoon, and in the past, journey time between one side of the city to the other side of the city took, you know, over an hour, you know, sometimes close to two hours to just move from one point to another. By that bridge, journey time was cut to about 30 minutes or less, which meant that people obviously spend more time with their families, and then the social fabric of society is a lot better than it was before. So sustainability is important, developmental impact is important, and so whenever we spend any dollar and make any dollar of investment, those are the things that we are looking for. So what are your thoughts about the first two sukuk that have been issued in Nigeria? I mean, no doubt those sukuk issuances were successful, in my opinion. Um, a lot of the investors are local, which is fine, which is great in terms of developing the local capital market. I think the government has taken the lead in trying to at least develop this product in the Nigerian economy, which I hope other people would you know, leverage on what the sovereign has done since they've created more like a benchmark and then people can use that and build on it and also issue sukuks in other forms or shapes in Nigeria. So I think that's been successful, it's great. Um, but again, look, the journey of a thousand mile starts with a step. We've taken you know, some steps forward in terms of issuing two sukuks. I hear there's a plan to issue a third one, but I'm hoping that the market will take a cue from the government and also with time we start to see corporate issuances in the sukuk space and ultimately even project bonds that are sukuk based, you know, happening over time. Do you think the future dollar based sukuk will be viable for the country? Absolutely, no doubt. I mean, we've done, we've issued a dollar sukuk. South Africa has issued a dollar sukuk. Uh, the UK has issued a dollar sukuk. So there's so many, there's precedent for sovereigns issuing sukuk. Nigeria has a good presence in the global capital market in terms of um, euro bond issuances, which has lots of conventional investors. I'm sure that if Nigeria wants to issue a dollar sukuk tomorrow, the market is there and it will be well received. So I have no doubt in my mind that it's a viable um, source of funding which the government should consider. What do you think should be done to make Islamic finance more viable in Nigeria? A couple of things. One, awareness. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. Islamic finance, sometimes, you know, people are just not aware, you know, of how the product is. That lack of education. And how do you solve that problem? Conferences, seminars, you know, thought leadership pieces, etc. to make people understand the product is quite important. So I think that's, that's one point. The other part of that, and I think it's more like a global issue, is Islamic finance for some reason still suffers from standardization. So if you want to issue a conventional euro bond, straightforward, fairly standardized. We know, you know what we know we're looking for. With Islamic finance, sometimes it's not. What is acceptable to one Sharia board is not acceptable to another Sharia board. And then you begin to struggle, how do we structure this to make sure it's widely acceptable and all that. So I think that's a second issue which I think we need to solve in order to make the product actually more uh, widely acceptable. And the third one, which I've seen from experience, is sometimes there's a conception by people that you know, when you are issuing a sukuk or you are issuing an Islamic finance product as an issuer, you are being asked to pay a premium over what you know, ordinarily you, know, you would have done if you are doing conventional. So as long as issuers have this feeling like it's being issued at a premium. I have to pay extra to some investors in order to access the Islamic finance market. They may not want to access that market. So I think if we solve all these problems, the issue of standardization, the issue of premium, and the issue of awareness, if we solve those three problems, then I think Islamic finance can take 
off in a very big way in Nigeria. Thank you so much, sir. It was an insightful discussion with you. Thank you, sir. And that will be all for today's edition of this program. You can send your questions and comments to news at pushyangi.com and reporter at pushyangi.com. Also, you can engage us on our social media and displaying on the screen. Many thanks for watching and bye for now.